good. I'm doing pretty good. It could be worse. Uh, All right, we good? We rolling? All right, well, you are listening to the Reholstered Podcast. I mistakenly say the Unholstered Podcast on our, like, YouTube every week when I write the description. The Reholstered Podcast. <laughs> um, today we have some very special guests. Before we hop into that, though, we got to make we got to do some business first. If you are listening and you are getting ready to buy either a holster or anything from our website, including the brand new stop box that we just threw up there uh, this last week, which is who is joining us, some folks from Stop Box. If you are getting ready to buy, make sure you use the promo code Reholstered. May? May. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Yeah, at this point, it's going to be reholstered May and say 15% on your purchase. Also, real quick, I want to give a shout out to all the people out there who are turkey hunting right now. I just want you to know, if you have not slain a gobbler, you're not alone. If you're out there calling them in, they call them back, they not walking to you. I just want you to know. You're not alone. We're here with you. I don't know if you guys are hunters. Uh, I had a turkey in my backyard last night, actually. Oh, man. Big I'm going to come watch it. I'm about to come up to the house. Yeah. Maybe Riley. I won't. They just, the tags are too expensive out there. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have Dylan and Calvin Irvin. Irvin. Yep. Yeah, I almost Irvin. said Wynn. I was it's like, oh, yeah. Win. And, and I had all the in time. notes, and then I almost said it still. Uh, we have the Calvin, or the Irwin. Irvin. <laughs> See how quickly I just messed that up? Now you're part of our 3%. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, there you go. The Irvin Brothers from Stopbox here. Stopbox USA yep. technically are here. Welcome to Alien Gear, guys. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Excited Thanks to be here. Us. So for the people who don't know, can you guys talk a little bit about, just from the very jump, what is Stopbox? Uh, and then we'll get into like the inception and all of those things. So we have Dylan, who is the founder and CEO, yep. and Calvin, who is the production man- yeah. uh, manager, along with, it seems like, a number of other things, including Troublemaker, <laughs> mischievous uh, man, all types of things. Yeah. But y'all break down kind of what Stopbox is for the um, audience yep. members who don't know. So the Stopbox, we call it a firearm retention device. So it is a place for your firearm to go when it's not in the holster and not in the safe. So that in between point when you're not you're not carrying a holstered gun, but you are also not leaving your gun in a safe. You want it to be still quickly accessible, right? So there's a lot of times where that might be. It might be when you're changing, like when you're hanging out with the kids in the living room or in the backyard, uh, having a dinner party, right? You may not have your gun holstered, um, but you may still want you know just general security for if somebody does kick in the front door or something like that. So the stop box bridges the gap between the holster and the safe. And so um, we're very particular. We don't call it a safe. And um, we do that for a reason is we don't want people to confuse what this is is and what it's intended to do. Mm. But the uh, um, the key differentiator between our product and the other products out there that kind of are meant to service the same kind of in between um, quick access safes, if you will, pistol safes. Um, the key differentiator is that our product is designed to actually work and function when you need it with the same reliability as your pistol, mm. right? So it is all mechanical. It does not use any batteries or electronics, and that is super intentional. The other key feature is that you can actually use it in the dark and under stress. So this is a big one, right? So I used to work in news, and um, right around when this, when I developed this, we had three back-to-back stories in our local community where a home invasion occurred and the victim did not wake up until the intruder had already forced entry into their bedroom. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this was in the middle of the night. So it's dark, you're disoriented and somebody's already forced in one case, a woman was being stabbed. Another one, a man had already grabbed onto her. So like in this situation, like we carry a gun for that extreme situation that, that like zero point, you know, point zero, zero, zero percent chance that something happens. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and those three, gave me kind of a reference point. It's like, okay, what could, what could those people have done? What could they have used mm. in that situation that actually would have given them the leverage in the situation to defend themselves? And I looked at every product on the market. And I said, you just would not realistically have been able to use this in their circumstance because it's dark, finding the right button, not hitting the wrong button. So imagine, you know, most products out there, they've got maybe five a five-digit electronic code or a thumb print reader. Imagine trying to use that in their situation scenario Mm -hmm. it's just it's not going to happen it's not realistic 
Um, and so I wanted something that was actually intuitive to use with in those people's cases, like something that they could reach over while their focus is maybe over here. They can reach over, find something that's in the dark, that's tactile and actually use and open up and get to their firearm and use it if they needed to um, in, in a case like that. And most other products, that's a right away was an eliminator is it, could you could you single handedly without looking at it access your gun and most products I'd say no because you'd you'd mess something up, but the other thing is um, when I was looking at products on the market and I'll back up a little bit the reason why um, I developed you know that the genesis of this was um, my daughter started walking she's nine nine months old started opening up drawers and I said okay I need to get my bedside pistol safe I need to I need to purchase one of those and so I started looking on the market for one. And I had uh, just fairly recently entered the industry um, and started getting into it, just started getting into the firearms industry as a whole. And w the one thing I knew for sure is that if Glock came out with a pistol that required a biometric read of your fingerprint in order for it to remove the safety or to function, nobody would buy it. Mm. However, every product on the market use that technology to essentially do the exact same thing. It's just in a box versus integrated into the gun, right? Yeah. And so I said, why is that? Why is there not an all mechanical tactile way to get to your gun quickly in case you need it? And this isn't to defend against somebody breaking into your home and stealing your stuff. Or, um, you know, that's like a safe. When you think of something big, heavy, bolted down, that's secure, right? Um, this is to keep little kids hands off to keep anybody's hands off mm. is the intruder coming in and seeing an, a gun on your nightstand or on your countertop. Um, is it, uh, family members? Is it relatives? Is it the kids friends coming over and playing hide and seek in the house and opening up a drawer and finding a gun, you know, it's to prevent that type of access. So in my mind, what the stop box is and what it does is conceal and prevent unintended access to your firearm while still giving you, access when you need it no matter what nice, nice so can you break down a little bit um like the from a production side how does the stop box work give us a give us a quick rundown of like it's on your uh bedside table it's on your dresser yeah um, so can i grab yeah, this one absolutely, and, yeah absolutely so um we put we put a, a exploding snake in there so be okay perfect. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> i'll make sure i don't open it then no, I'll just play. um so this is this is actually kind of the um the secret sauce to like to what we do so we actually have a utility patent on the locking design itself um and it's really simple and this is what i what i was thinking of when i was coming up with this is um you need something to be able like essentially an, a key right to open it and i thought well i definitely don't want it to be an external key because then you're gonna have to keep track of something else yeah. and there's um you know many ways that that can that can fail like but your hand is actually required to use a pistol, mm -hmm. right? You're, you know, you need your fingers to be able to use that. So that's always going to be with you. I mean, for most people, for a lot of people, to some degree. Um, and so, okay, well, you got five fingers similar to like the ridges on a key, right? And the way a key works, you've got five pin tumblers. You got these these pins that have to be aligned a certain way, and then that's what allows the barrel to then rotate, and you can turn the key. So what this is is essentially the reverse of that. So instead of it being contained in a barrel inside, it's on the outside and your hand creates the key. So what you have with that is you've got these finger actuators that correspond to your hand. And if you notice, it's mapped on the corner of the enclosure here. And that's for a very particular reason. That's so you can actually reference something. So that's the mm. tactile part of this, right? Yeah. So most other safes or whatever you um you know quick access lock boxes they've got their their digits right here mm -hmm. and so that doesn't give you any feedback to know where you're at whereas this you can find that corner yeah. very easily and that's and what's going to open mm -hmm. that's the side that's going to open and everything yep. and so when your hand finds those finds those actuators right it basically positions them perfectly so now all you have to do is press in your code and the way that works is each one of these buttons can move between three different positions. So you have all the way out, all the way in, and then in between. Mm. So that gives you between these four buttons, 81 different combinations that you can select between. Mm. And then you've got to press in the thumb lock once you press in your code. And then if you notice, there's also a reveal here, right? Um, yeah. So the enclosure halves, they don't sit all the way closed and that's right. intentional. So if you think of um, this kind of like a chill or a pill bottle, cap mm -hmm. um a child lock pill bottle cap right you got to align an arrow press down and open it up right 
So this is a, a pressure safety feature. So if you press in the code, and assuming this one is default, pressing the code, it's not going to open until you actually push down on the lid, and now it will be able to open. We should have changed the code. We should have changed <laughs> it. Like, oh, this is supposed to work, yep. man. What happened? Um, and no snake came out. That's cool. Yeah, there you go. There you um, go. It was fun to like watch people like feel confident. Like We gave them the code um, uh -huh. when we first got these, when you guys came the first time. And oh, I've seen this before on the internet. And they go to do it, and they're just like, ah, but I thought it was. No, no I gave you the code. Keep going, man. Yep. And they couldn't open it up. But that, that, um, I mean, it's essentially a so, fifth lock at that point. Yep, it is. It is tricky, and that's um, because this is unique, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you do give somebody the code, it does take some practice. And what we've noticed actually is that you can give this to a group of 100 people, and 50 of them are gonna get it almost immediately, and then the other 50 mm. are gonna be yeah. are gonna struggle, yeah. and then. What's gonna honestly happen is ego is gonna come into play, yeah. and they're, it's gonna exasperate it a little bit. They're gonna struggle they like more. They like try to force it. <laughs> yeah. Like, right. No. No. I got yeah. this. I got this. Um, and so that is something that we've noticed. Is some people uh, they get it right away, and some people uh, they struggle with it. So, uh, and I was actually one of the ones that struggled with it. So when I got our first prototype, um, I, a lot of you know pent up excitement to getting the first prototypes, taking something that was just an idea yeah. and getting the first physical version of it, um, I could not get it to open. I had the exact same struggles. Yeah. And I thought, wow, what a what a failure. Um, and then all of a sudden, it was, I think it took me about four minutes. Then all of a sudden I got it. And then that, basically that uh, uh, muscle uh, movement was kind of mapped in my brain and all of a sudden I couldn't unlearn it. It was kind of like learning to ride a bike. Mm. And as soon as I figured it out, all of a sudden it became, wait, this is totally doable. This yeah. actually works. So I've experienced that. I know firsthand that it can be challenging at first, but if you just look at the videos, right? We're not using different stop boxes. Everyone's right. using the same one. When you see a video of somebody opening it quickly, yeah. that can be you too. It just might take a little bit of practice. But then once you do get it, what is cool is um, just because the way it's designed, like I can be looking at you and I can open it yeah. up that, that quickly. I didn't want to bonk your, your mic here, but no, you're you know, it's really quick to open but then like you just described you can hand it to somebody even give them the code and they may not be able to open it yeah, yeah. so take it back just a little bit you, you, you mentioned about the kind of the design phase what was that process like from in your brain you kind of knew kind of what you wanted to do but do you have an engineering background and then you know a lot of times you'll see like uh entrepreneurs who have the idea but then have to bring people on or get people involved uh to like bring that dream to fruition talk about that a little bit that yep. beginning stage and kind of how it got to where it is today um so don't uh, give no trade secrets though I don't yeah. know, you know uh I am not an engineer, but when I was um, about 10 years old, I had a big uh, sh career shift in my mind. And I said, I want to be a mechanical engineer. So 10 years it's, old, nah, 10 years old. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and be before that, I had other ambitions. But um, uh, so I know for a fact that as early as 10, um, that was something that I aspired to do and be as a mechanical engineer and, mm -hmm. and designer. And that's just because I liked tinkering and taking things apart and yeah. building something new out of it. Our grandfather used to send us gifts from a dealership he worked at. They were just like the freebies, right? They're little electronic remote control cars, CD players. And I get these and he send us like seven of them because there's seven kids in our family. And the first thing I did was I would take them apart to understand how they work, see if I could put it back together to reaffirm that I understood how it actually worked. And then I would disassemble it all again and organize all the parts into bins and come up with something new to make out of the parts. Yeah. So I did have the, the early on the tendency to just kind of be a, a tinker and, th and try to think differently about things and come up with ideas. Mm -hmm. I, I uh, designed and made a gas powered bike when I was, I think, 14 uh, <laughs> years old. And so d built something that is, you know, so I, I just liked building stuff. You were the kid going around the neighborhood like, ah, that, that those mm -hmm. loud, Oh loud, yeah, loud, oh loud. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. a weed whacker on steroids. Yeah, it was, oh, wow. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it was a, yeah pretty, uh, yeah, obnoxious. Um, yeah. So uh, early on, I knew that uh, actually, you know, inventor was one of the things that I would, when I heard of um, somebody local who's an, uh, an inventor, mm -hmm. um, that definitely was something that I said, oh man, one day, yeah. that would be the coolest thing to be an inventor. Um, but then I got sidetracked. I fell into video production and filmmaking. Mm -hmm. um, and that pretty much took most of my career for the next 10 years was just doing um, filmmaking uh, and working as a TV producer. Yes. And so that's that's where I was working at a, at uh, Creme 2 News. Um, but back to 
how I uh, went about developing this. So knowing that I had the aptitude in general to like try to make something at yeah. least when I first came up with the idea um, for the stop box, uh, I actually, I went to my dad's house. I was on my way home from work. And instead of going home, I stopped by my dad's house and uh, I tried explaining it to him. Um, I, I tried explaining what, what my concept was. Um, and I remember this conversation uh, specifically, as I said, I have no idea how to design, engineer a product that can be mass produced and how to take that product to market, how to patent something. I have no idea how to do any of this. I was telling this to my dad, but I think this, is, this would be worth it. I remember him t telling, that, telling him that in his uh, doorway before I left. I said, I think this will be worth it. Um, and so from there, I uh, basically just tried to realize it as a prototype. And so um, doing a lot of different things to uh, just self-designing, sketching it out, um, fabricating it in my dad's shop, um, and not really getting anywhere. Basically, I got to where I had a rough, rough concept. Um, but it was one of my buddies who is, who is an engineer uh, that came to me. Uh, he knew I had this uh, product idea. And he had to, he was actually at the time, I believe, making the decision to either move with his company because the company he'd worked for for quite a, quite a long time was moving or stay and maybe start his own firm. Mm. And so I uh, was invoice 0001 with his firm that he started. Mm. And that was his first product that he worked on was the stop box. Nice. And so um, he professionally engineered it uh, for me. And um, we worked very closely on that, um, developing it. And then it was just, okay, going down the path of engineering it, working with an engineer, like that felt like something actually moving forward with it. Now it's time to do everything else yeah. that goes with it. Yeah. And like, oh boy. <laughs> so, um, and that was back in uh, 2014 mm -hmm. is, it was when the, um, when I first had the idea. And uh, it was 2016 when I formed the actual company, gotcha. um, the LLC. And, and it wasn't until um, we had delays, you know, everything takes way longer than yeah. you expect. Um, we started selling a product in a pre-order uh, fashion in 2017, but didn't start delivering it till 2018. So the first product went out to customers in 2018. Nice. So you, you talked quite a bit there about your family, kind of like, you know, you're, you're talking to your dad about the, the idea and even like the whole friends thing, like you had a friend who helped you with engineering, kind of where you all sit right now, you have quite a few mm. members of the family and probably your your friends on the team. Yep. Talk a little bit about that and kind of uh, what that dynamic is like working with your family. Did you always know, because you said you come from a family of seven kids? Seven kids, yeah. Nice, I, I'm, I'm the youngest of five, so I kind okay. of know that yeah. world. Yeah. Um, but talk about that dynamic a little bit. Did you always think you wanted to work with your family? You wanted to like bring them in or was that kind of just something that came I along? Think I think initially it was looking for cheap labor. Ooh, but. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> that would have been that now. Um, I think uh, as as the company's been growing and, and snowballing, um, I think everyone in our family has a particular set of skills mm -hmm. that made so much sense to work with them and leverage them. So right now, our head of product development is um, one of our brothers, Zach, he is, uh, he is a mechanical engineer nice. um, and he is a savant with coming up with stuff. Mm -hmm. Like he, uh, um, do you remember when he came to us and said, or he was watching um, while you were assembling stop boxes, this was in 2018, I think. And he saw how you were having to align the uh, washers with the screws. Mm -hmm. And he said, I can design something for you that will automatically connect the screws with the washers. And later that night, he literally went home, designed something, drafted it up on the computer in CAD, and then 3D printed it. And I think that same night sent us a video of an actual functioning prototype of something that took screws and washers, mm -hmm. mated them together, and, mm -hmm. and fed them out. Yeah. And the the fact that uh, in in his case, that you can have the skills to actually execute, like have yeah. an original idea and execute quickly, like. That was a no-brainer to yeah. to incorporate him. Just like a rapid prototyper in your yeah. family. Yeah, oh, yeah. exactly. Amazing. Um, we actually have another brother, um, Justin, who is uh, similar. 
Uh, he's the youngest. And um, Shout out to the youngest out there. Yeah. <laughs> Justin, I just want you to know I feel your pain. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I can definitely see the pain. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and then um, Calvin, Calvin is a doer. Mm. Like that's, Calvin brings, like he's going to get it done. Yeah. I don't think anybody else in the company I can give a directive to and it gets done faster than when I give it to Calvin. So nice. um, Calvin was, uh, so it was you and Sienna. You guys mm -hmm. were the very first employees um, of the business. You guys were the first ones assembling stop boxes. Um, and then eventually Justin came on, uh, Zach came on. Um, these are all siblings. Mm. Uh, my dad, my dad is, um, he's, I don't know. How would you describe dad? What is, he, um, he, he, gosh, problem solving. Yeah. Creativity. Yeah. Uh, a builder. Um, yeah, he can fabricate anything. Give him a little bit of time and he'll come back yeah. with something that looks like, you know, somebody spent years engineering and designing. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's kind of in the blood to be able to just like make it happen, whether it's just like doing it or like thinking of it and crafting it. That that kind of comes from your all's parents. Yeah. I don't see crafting your uh, Okay, Siri, <laughs> you calm down. <laughs> They're always they watching. Want, yeah. <laughs> I had to turn it off on this iPad because we were, we just went through this a minute ago. Yeah, jeez. Yeah, well, um, well, do you remember growing up? What did we do? Yeah. Any chance we could, we got, we went into Dad's shop and yeah. we would be yeah, building I, stuff. Yeah, I feel like uh, I don't know if it was a birthday or Christmas, but I got a, a wooden toy book <laughs> that you could build your own toys. And our dad was a custom cabinet maker our okay. whole our whole life, yeah. and uh, he had a shop with everything we needed. So I mean gosh, maybe four or five years old, we were yeah, learning to there. operate the bandsaw um, and just, just help them out with projects. But we built most of our toys, Yeah, I think. Yeah, I mean, to this day, um, oh, yeah. whenever dad makes gifts for my kids, yeah. they're always hand-built toys that I'm like, oh my gosh, how much time do you spend? Oh, I worked on this last night. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. That's awesome. Um, can you guys speak a little bit about kind of the, um, I mean, when when you come up with a, with a, product on your own you kind of engineered in-house not in-house but like that whole process um, is amongst you and yours um what does that kind of like quality control process look like for you all kind of you know because it's a it's a big step in a lot of ways to um be an entrepreneur be an inventor like really believe in your dream believe that it's not going to be something that's just a uh, something that you built for your little cousin. No, mm -hmm. this is a product that's going to be going to m protect families in the w best and worst of times. Um, what is what is that thought process like, and kind of what's that that uh, uh, quality control, um, a quality assurance process look like for you guys? Well, I think I think it's one thing to build a product, but it's a whole other thing to turn that product into a business. Mm -hmm. So, and as far as that aspect of it, that's that's what Dylan's in charge of. I like to tell people I'm I'm in charge of most things beneath his office. Mm -hmm. So I get to do the hands-on stuff, um, working with all the production team members, um, working with our brother Zach to set up the production lines mm -hmm. and um, to come up with those checks and balances and how we do our quality control. Yeah. Um, and it's really, our motto is continuous improvement. Right. So what it looks- in? Right. Come on, let's exactly. go, Sean, where are you at? <laughs> yeah, so what it looked like in the beginning was was very, or is, is very different than what it looks like today. Mm. Um, uh, in the beginning, it was very single cell assembly. Uh, myself and Sienna in, a very small office where we had essentially what was a closet mm. with a couple of workstations where we're doing complete assembly A to Z um, by ourselves. And now today we're doing one piece flow with multiple production lines mm -hmm. where each station's actually quality checking the station before it, mm. because if something was missed or not done properly, yeah. well then that station can't do what they were supposed to do. Yeah. So by the time it gets to QC, that position's really kind of transformed more into let's clean it down. We're gonna inspect everything and then we're gonna package it with the with the right user manual and combination card. Yeah. Um, so really to this day, the quality control aspect is done the, the whole way through up until it gets put into a box. Mm. Um, and we found it's extremely effective um, to be able to do it this way, where instead of one set of eyes, we've got we've got six to seven on each unit that yeah. goes, goes out the door. So you, um, another thing I wanted to ask you guys about is like, you guys have the stop box, but that's not the only product that you all, actually the first time I 
um, heard about your all's company, it wasn't this. Uh, the homie Darian Mack out there in Spokane um, gave me the uh, the one for my AR. I don't know what chamber lock. Yep, yeah. the chamber, yeah. the chamber lock. Yeah. yeah, that's the first time I heard about you all. But talk a little bit about all the kind of the yep. they got belts, you know, yeah. that type of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the stop box um, was our first product. And, and was it that big? Was it that size? No. Nope. So our, this is our Gen 2. We call this the Stopbox Pro. Um, mm -hmm. It was the first one was a little bit smaller um, and it had uh, a little bit of, of a different design. But um, yeah, functionally, uh, as far as user um, using it, it's it operated the same. Uh, but our first product was the Stopbox. And then after that, and this is when Zach came on board, he developed the chamber lock mm -hmm. with me. So I had the idea for the chamber lock and he did all the engineering and product development for that. And uh, it essentially all the chamber lock does is take our locking design and put it into a compact form that goes into the chamber of your gun mm -hmm. and locks it up. Um, so in the, the need for that is kind of, um, you know, also a little bit, of a of a bridge between a couple of things right a lot of people uh just leave want you know want to just have a gun a, a rifle somewhere and uh a lot of them don't have them sitting in a safe they have them sitting out and they have them in all various conditions what's cool about the chamber lock is that you can insert it into your gun with a mag fully loaded magazine um so essentially once you rip the chamber lock out you drop drop the bolt you're ready to go it's completely ready it takes less than a couple of seconds to mm -hmm. put your gun in into uh, operation um but when it's in there you now have a visual reference to know the exact condition of your gun so if you put a chamber lock inside of your gun and you see your gun sitting over there um you know whether it's in the bedroom or the living room you know the exact condition it's in right. not versus is it chambered unchambered is mm -hmm. the magazine full loaded mm -hmm. you know that if it's still in there you know it's how you left it um and now it gives you the flexibility to move your gun around without with with having basically there's no way this gun's going to go off because it's literally got a block of metal inside of the chamber mm. you know blocking where the bullets would go and so um it just gives you that peace of mind that i can handle this move it around put it wherever i need to and not have to think about you know what condition it's in you can also take it to the range and um, use it as a chamber flag where ranges require it and stuff like that um so I did, we definitely saw a use case there. And so that was our second product uh, was the AR chamber lock. And then we made a uh, variant for shotguns and they fit with um, any Mossberg 500 or, um, yep. Let's go back to combo. Yep, or the Remington 870 <laughs> yeah. um, or anything similar. Most shotguns actually model off of those chamber sizes. So um, for the 12 gauge shotgun, uh, it's pretty universal. So now we have a, um, an AR lock, a shotgun chamber lock, um, and then uh, after that, we came out with a uh, wall-mounted version of the original stop box, and we call that the ward, the mm. wall-anchored retention device. Um, and so we have we have that option as well. But definitely, our our kind of hero product is the stop box pro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you guys are in Spokane, right? Yep. Where about? Can, is this is this an online only, or is this can people come? Kind of see you yeah we do have that. a little retail store um a little uh showroom, showroom. yep mm -hmm. uh so we're in the uh we're in the valley yeah we're in the i'm just thinking i just moved i'm just outside of the valley so anytime i write out my address i have to not put valley on the end um but yeah we're in uh, spokane valley uh and we've got a little showroom there um but that's where our whole facility is and we're uh we're not completely vertically integrated like you guys but we, um, everything from, everything outside of injection molding, basically, mm. we are. So we do, we try to do everything in-house. For the chamber locks, we do pretty much everything in-house with those. Um, and that just gives us the control and ability to, like you said, with uh, quality control, that's a big one. We've mm -hmm. worked with contract manufacturing and it just adds a layer of complexi complexity mm -hmm. to how you manage um, your quality control. And so uh, having everything under one roof and the um you know limiting the amount of people that are having to touch and handle different things has been really helpful to keep awesome quality control do you uh when you look back at your at the journey of Stopbox, um what what words of encouragement or advice or like what would you say to yourself uh in 2000 and let's say 16 17 mm -hmm. what, what would that message be 
That is a good question. So um, the journey, uh, <laughs> the journey with Stopbox, um, there's definitely been, there was definitely times early on trying to get the product out where I would have, um, I was ready to put in the towel on uh, me being the sole owner. Okay, so um, willing to take on investors just to help get this thing across the finish line, get mm -hmm. it done. Um, and because uh, up to the, up to that point, um, I had it was all my own money, it was all my own, you know, everything. I was the only owner, and uh, so there's a lot of a lot of times where um, getting turned down uh, f for f finance um, was brutal, but it forced me to figure it out hmm. and make it work, and that has been the I think the number one thing that. Um, that I uh, don't regret is maintaining being the single owner of yeah. the company. And um, so the, most of the challenges I think I had was, uh, was just coming up with the funds to take it to the next step, pay for engineering, pay for prototypes, pay yeah. for tooling, pay to get it, uh, you know, the uh, uh, patents, you know, everything like, just, yeah. like nonstop. Um, and the hardest part was, you know what is the what is the right decision here is it to try to bring on investment um or just continue to bootstrap it and uh i'm glad i i did not take on in investment and i was able to do it so um i probably tell myself to uh uh you know challenges sometimes are are the things that push you to you know to limits that you didn't know you were possible mm -hmm. right so um, sometimes the easy way out, you know, and just saying, you know what, I'm just going to try to do this instead sometimes, um, being, being basically put in that pressure cooker to, you know, you, you just, you have to figure, there's no other option. You have to figure it out at this point. Yeah. So once you're, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars into a, a project, you know, you're like, okay, do, well, you know, that's a hard decision to make, you know, do you let it die or do you, you know, what do you do? And so, um, yeah, just being uh, resilient, you know, just continue to be resilient. Yeah. Now, right now, there's a guy out there who he sleeps with his gun on his... Uh, nightstand. Nightstand or under his pillow. Yep. <laughs> fully loaded, ready to go. Showers with it. Showers. Listen, man, I was 21 once. Showers <laughs> with it on the, on the, uh, on the rack. Uh, right next to the soap where it's nice and slippery. Um, he has his AR next to his battle. He has his battle belt next to his base, ready for war. Yep. And he says, why do I need the stop box? Yep. I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready yeah. to go. Yep. Why does he need the stop box, guys? That is that is probably um, the question we get mm -hmm. most. Mm -hmm. um, that is the question we get most is, why do I need one? And um, <laughs> here's, here's the thing. Um, I can tell a uh, story. I'll try to leave out. Um, so this is somebody who's kind of close uh, to um, our community, but um, I'll leave out any uh, details. But this is a pretty powerful story. Mm -hmm. um, when it, as I was developing the stop box, they looked, they were kind of watching and they were um, seeing the prototypes I was developing. And they said, this is really cool. This is going to be useful to a lot of people. Um, but this is not something for me. This is not something that I would probably use because I don't have kids and it's just my wife and I, and we keep our house locked. You're, you're, are you talking about me right now? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, he, he would give me, you know, the pat on the back, but say I, it would, it's going to be useful. People are going to find use out of it, but not for me. I say, okay. Um, and then a little later on, um, not quite a year, we started shipping the product out and, uh, I run into him and he says, um, uh, Dylan, I have two stop boxes now. I said, really? I remember you telling me, you know, you didn't think it was you, for you. You don't have kids. You keep your house locked. You gave me these reasons. And he said, um, yeah, but that's all changed. He said that he went home one night after work and he took his gun um, out of his waistband. It was still in the holster. Okay. So this is his chambered gun inside of the holster and set it on his coffee table. He was watching football, so it's just an, an evening. He had his feet kicked up on the coffee table, and uh, his house is locked, just him and his wife home, and he dozed off. He said about 45 minutes later, I woke up to a little seven-year-old girl playing with my loaded gun, and, and it was pointed at herself. 
And how did that happen? While he was asleep, the doorbell rang. His wife answered the door. It was a new neighbor who had just moved in to bring over cookies, and she was with her seven-year-old daughter. Mm. The two uh, wives got to chatting, and the daughter got bored. And so she wandered in a little bit. And the first thing she saw was a gun sitting there, you know, and seven years old, you know, didn't know, picked it up. And so that's what he woke up to. And he told me, I will never again try to predict the scenario Mm. where I might need to secure my gun from somebody else. And so I think that's a powerful one because it doesn't give you, it doesn't give you the answer in the way of here's some scenarios where you might need it. It gives you the answer in, is it worth trying to come up with a scenarios? Does it matter? Mm our product does not limit your access to your gun it is literally as quick as opening a drawer that's something that you know to open a drawer and dig your gun out of it or find your gun is no faster than opening up a stop box or removing the chamber lock out of the chamber so it's not preventing you from using your gun but what it is doing is giving you the upper hand that if somebody else whether it's an intruder or an unexpected guest Mm -hmm. from using that gun to harm themselves or somebody else in the home so Man, that is powerful. And I think I'm going to uh, now stop just keeping loaded guns in every room in my house <laughs> and get some stop boxes. So good uh, sales. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for coming on and uh, kind of telling your story. It's a cool story. It's a powerful story. Uh, we've had a number of uh, entrepreneurs and people who have invented things. Our very own um, Randy uh, yep. Watts. I almost said Evans for some reason. Uh, Randy Watts. Um, another guy who had an idea and, you know, just like seeing it through and in times where it's like rough, you mm-hmm. know, I don't know that struggle of coming up with something yourself and having to see hundreds of thousands of dollars into this project that then could just like go away. Yep. I mean, that, that has to be, uh, has to weigh on you yep. a little bit, but congratulations mm-hmm. and all your success, man. You guys are thank you coming out with some cool stuff. Uh, I need to get a belt. I don't know, you know, what, what's going on with that. <laughs> but uh, no, seriously, guys, thank you all so much for coming on. Yeah, awesome. we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Also, before we hop out of here, make sure you uh, use code reholstered may get 15% off of a stop box that you can find right now. Show them the stop box with the alien gear logo on there. Come on, baby. The partnership. Oh, yeah. Let's go. Let's go. All right. We'll talk to you all next time. Uh-huh.